Up until the 1990s, the island of Montserrat, in its entirety, was a popular tourist destination deep in the heart of the Caribbean, with its capital city of Plymouth being a major hotspot for relaxing resorts, beautiful beaches, and densely forested hills that overshadowed this small harbour town. Then, in 1997, the peace of this humble island was shattered, when deep from within the earth, powerful forces led to one of the most violent volcanic eruptions of the 20th century, with burning ash and pyroclastic flows tumbling down the flanks of the Soufriere Hills Peak that stood above Plymouth, and leading to the southern half of the island becoming off-limits, leaving what little remains to return to nature as the volcano continues to show intermittent activity. The island of Montserrat is located in the Caribbean Sea, and form parts of a long chain of volcanic isles known as the Leeward Islands, being positioned between Antigua to the north and Guadeloupe to the south, while also standing as one of the smaller Caribbean nations, being only 9.9 .9 miles long and 6.8 miles wide. The existence of the island is owed entirely to the presence of its resident volcano, the Soufriere Hills, which takes its name from the French word for sulphur outlet, and is one of several volcanoes in the Caribbean to share this name, the others being La Soufriere on St. Vincent and La Grande Soufriere on Guadeloupe. Little is known about the original volcano and its formation, but the mountain and island that exist today were the result of a cataclysmic eruption approximately 4,000 years ago, when the summit of the original peak collapsed, leading to a massive subsidence that ultimately helped to expand the island, leaving English's crater as the current peak. In terms of human habitation, prior to the island's discovery by European explorers, archaeology reveals that Montserrat was inhabited by an archaic, pre-Arawak occupation between 2000 and 500 BC, while in later years, the Saladoid culture came to live on the island until around 550 AD, and finally the native Caribs, who are believed to have called the island Aluagana, meaning land of the prickly bush. In November 1493, Christopher Columbus passed the island during his second voyage, naming it Montserrat in honour of the Santa Maria de Montserrat Abbey in Catalonia, Spain, the island, at the time, being reportedly uninhabited due to raids by the Carib people, though it wouldn't be until 1632 that Montserrat was eventually colonised by groups of Irish Catholics who had been exiled to the Caribbean during the conquest of Ireland by English Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. The Irish Catholics weren't the first European settlers on the island, however, with archaeological evidence suggesting that there were unofficial European settlements prior to this, these being largely believed to be pirates or smugglers who used Montserrat as a base to hide from the Royal Navy. Under the control of Sir Thomas Warner, the first English governor of the nearby island of St Kitts, and a major figure in the Caribbean slave trade, he was responsible for organising Irish exiles who had been indentured to the English colonists in both the Leeward Islands and North America, with Irish slaves on Montserrat being tasked primarily with working tobacco and indigo plantations, later joined by cotton and sugar. In 1666, during the Second Anglo-Dutch War, the Irish, who had long been allies of the French in their struggle against the English, invited French forces to occupy Montserrat, though no troops were actually sent to claim it, and although an invasion did commence in early 1667, with the French briefly taking control of the island, the Treaty of Breda, a peace treaty signed on July 31, 1667, between England and the United Provinces, France and Denmark-Norway, to end the Second Anglo-Dutch War, handed Montserrat back to the English. As the island continued to develop, the Irish slaves gradually began to create their own neo-feudal colony with a small government, this being followed by the shipment of sub-Saharan African slaves en masse to Montserrat during the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, thus establishing the economy of the island through the cultivation of sugar, rum, arrowroot and sea island cotton. During Queen Anne's War between 1702 and 1713, the French, based on the adjacent Guadeloupe, launched an attack against the newly established capital of Plymouth, but this was ultimately unsuccessful, while by the mid-1700s, the island was at its most prosperous and most populous, with a peak export of 3,150 tonnes of sugar being made in 1735 alone, and a population of 10,177 people, most of whom were slave labourers, with dozens of plantations being scattered about Montserrat and wealth being rife among the owners. The same couldn't be said for the slaves, though, who suffered harshly under brutal, inhumane treatment in order to harvest the crop, 
thus leading on March 17, 1768, or St. Patrick's Day, to a group of slaves and free citizens planning an uprising against the plantation owners, but their scheme was ultimately discovered and they were sentenced to death. However, their attempt at freedom was not forgotten, and March 17th on Montserrat remains both a celebration of St. Patrick's Day due to the Irish heritage of the island, but also of the resilience of the afro montserratians who planned the uprising, as well as their descendants. In 1782, during the American Revolutionary War, the French, who had aligned themselves with the American colonists against the English, once again made a bid to invade Montserrat, and this time they were successful. The French occupation of the island, though, being not strictly enforced, and was more a symbolic invasion rather than a tactical move, with Montserrat being promptly returned to Great Britain under the Treaty of Paris on September 3, 1783. By 1811, slave labour represented 91% of Montserrat's population, and the many plantations across the island were still highly lucrative to the British landowners, that this would be upturned by the undying rumbles of emancipation that swept through the colonised world the first cracks in the slave trade emerging in May 1772, following Lord Mansfield's judgment in the Somerset's case to emancipate a slave in England, thus launching the movement to abolish slavery. Eventually, rebellions in Jamaica and the outlawing of the slave trade in 1807 culminated in the passing of the Slavery Abolition Act on July 26, 1833, coming into force on August 1, 1834, though while slavery on Montserrat was no longer legal, this wasn't appreciated by the landowners, who continued to employ their former labourers under the new title of apprentices, although the working conditions were largely the same. The rule of apprenticeship continued to exist until an 1836 visit by abolitionist Joseph Sturge IV and Thomas Harvey, who were touring the Caribbean colonies in order to make sure the Slavery Abolition Act was being enforced, the discovery leading to an appeal being made by Sturge and Harvey to the British government for intervention. And finally, in 1838, the apprenticeship rule was ended on August 1st, and full emancipation was achieved. Their joy was short-lived, though, as a massive 8.5 earthquake on February 8, 1843, the epicentre of which was under the nearby island of Guadeloupe, killed 5,000 people and destroyed much of the infrastructure on the island, dealing a major blow to the economy, though while matters appeared bleak, the intervention of the Sturge family, which established a citrus lime industry on the island, helped to revitalise Montserrat's economic woes, and the Montserrat Company Limited would thrive throughout the 1800s and well into the 1900s, when it was replaced by Sea Island Cotton. In 1899, nature dealt another vicious blow against Montserrat when the San Serrato hurricane struck the island in mid-August of that year, severely damaging the citrus lime industry and destroying the Sturge family home. Though regardless, the company recovered and soon the economy was put back onto an even keel, with schools being built and the city of Plymouth expanded into a bustling port. From 1871 to 1958, Montserrat was administered as a federal crown colony of the British Leeward Islands, before becoming a province of the short-lived West Indies Federation between 1958 and 1962, the first chief minister of Montserrat, William Henry Bramble, leading the nation on behalf of the Montserrat Labour Party from 1960 to 1970, working to promote labour rights and exploit the potential tourist market as air travel brought more European and American tourists to the Caribbean. It was under his authority that the island's airfield, the somewhat rudimentary Blackburn Airstrip, as opened in 1957, was expanded from a dirt field to a fully functioning airport in 1967, with a paved runway, control tower and terminal facilities. This field later being renamed to the W.H. Bramble Airport in his honour on March 16, 1997, only three months before it was destroyed. Bramble made great efforts to endear the island as much as possible to French and British tourists, with Air Montserrat being established to ferry passengers from the British colonies of Antigua and St. Kitts, as well as the French Guadeloupe, while the profits from the bustling tourist industry were used to create paved roads and establish grand hotels to cater to European visitors, including the Viewpoint Hotel and Olveston House. In 1979, the island caught the eye of Beatles manager George Martin, who established a recording studio under his independent record company, Associated Independent Recording or AIR, 
the Air Montserrat studio quickly becoming a major destination for some of the world's leading musicians, the peacefulness of the locale and the beauty of the studio's surroundings being both the perfect escape and inspiration for songwriters. In May 1979, Jimmy Buffett recorded his ninth studio album, Volcano, at the Air Studio, the name taken from the ever-present Soufriere Hills volcano that silently dominated the island's landscape with Volcano reaching number 14 on the Billboard Top 200. While Dire Straits would record their successful Brothers in Arms album between 1984 and 1985, with other artists using the Air Studio, including Elton John, The Police, Ultravox, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, Paul McCartney, Marvin Gaye, Rush, The Rolling Stones, Black Sabbath, Midjour, Little River Band, Duran Duran, Sheena Easton, and Luther Vandross. The presence of the Air Montserrat studio gave the island a celebrity edge in the same manner as Montreux in Switzerland and Abbey Road in London, and it wasn't uncommon for megastars to be seen walking the streets of Plymouth and mingling with the locals, with word of certain celebrities being on the island, leading to fans swarming to Plymouth in the hope of meeting their idols, thus having the effect of boosting the economy, the standard of living being exceptionally high compared to other Caribbean islands, and Montserrat seems set for a prosperous future. However, politically, there had been serious tensions among the two factions of Montserrat's governing parties, most notably between William Henry Bramble and his son Percival Austin Bramble, with W. H. Bramble being highly supportive of the tourist industry and its ability to boost the economy, while Percival Bramble was critical of this major influx, as well as the continued presence of British rule and its influence over government decisions. Breaking off from his father's party, Percival formed the Progressive Democratic Party, which swept into power in 1970, making him the Chief Minister until 1978, Bramble later being followed by Chief Minister John Osborne of the People's Liberation Movement, who created a rift between Montserrat and Great Britain through his flirtation with independence, although none of his statements came to pass. Regardless, much of W. H. Bramble's work to expand the tourist industry in Montserrat was slowed during this period, resulting in a restriction of the economic snowball he had created during the 1960s, while in 1989, disaster struck once again in the form of Hurricane Hugo, which made landfall on September 17th. The hurricane, a sustained Category 4, damaging or destroying 90% of the structures on Montserrat, leaving between 11,000 and 12,000 people homeless. Schools, churches, the hospital, the police department, the government headquarters and the main power station were either destroyed or heavily damaged, disrupting electrical, water and telephone service for weeks, while the 180-foot stone jetty at Plymouth was inundated by a storm surge and rainfall of up to 7 inches caused mudslides that destroyed 21 homes, the outcome of the hurricane being 10 people killed and 89 injured, while over $260 million of damage was incurred, making it the most expensive hurricane in the history of Montserrat. Destruction of infrastructure meant that both tourism and agriculture couldn't function, and the economy faced a huge decline, while at the same time, the air studio was lost due to its sustaining heavy damage by the hurricane, though while this could have been repairable, a change in music industry trends, whereby it was preferable for artists to be kept at local studios in the United States and Europe, rather than independent studios in remote parts of the world, meant that there was no incentive to reopen this facility. One major ecological loss was the Guadeloupe big-eyed bat population on the island, which saw a drop of 90% following Hurricane Hugo, and has since been rendered extinct on Montserrat. Though regardless, Montserrat rebuilt, and mutterings of independence by John Osborne were quickly quelled when aid was provided by the British, Osborne eventually being ousted from power in 1991. However, while the damage was quickly fixed and the economy gradually rebuilt, the ever-present Soufriere Hills remained as an active and well-remembered volcanic peak that stood in dangerous proximity to Plymouth and the surrounding communities, its last major activity being prior to its colonisation, when in 1550 AD, the Castle Peak eruption sent between 25 and 65 million cubic metres of lava down its slopes. In around 1645, lava emerged within a sector collapse scar on the mountain's flank, forming a lava dome, but no major eruption on the scale of the 1550 event took place, though seismic activity kept geologists in check, with minor tremors occurring in swarms between 1897 and 1898, 1933 and 1937, and 1966 and 1967, 
but while these quakes signaled the movement of magma within the mountain, no eruptions occurred, and for decades people had settled on the flanks of the volcano, unaware of its destructive nature. The first signs of increased activity began as early as April 1989, when swarms of tremors once again rocked the island, while between January 1992 and mid-1994, the volcano entered another period of seismic activity, and measurements taken in March 1995 by British volcanologists noted pronounced magmatic signatures in the Castle Peak Lava Dome. The resumption of earthquake activity, especially since it followed the pattern of 30-year cycles, meant that there was very little evidence that the volcano was expected to enter an eruptive stage, but regardless of this, the seismic activity continued to be measured, and scans determined that the epicentre of these quakes was incredibly shallow, at less than 10 kilometres below the surface. Debates as to whether an eruption was to occur were silenced permanently, when, on the afternoon of July 18, 1995, a loud roar reminiscent of a jet engine emerged from the mountain, followed closely by a pronounced sulphur smell and the first ash fallout from the initial phreatic eruption. Montserrat, at the time, hosting a population of 10,500 people, of which the vast majority were in Plymouth on the southwestern flanks of the volcano. On July 28th, a military contingency plan was drafted that designated areas where the potential fallout of the eruption would be unlikely to result in major impacts, and on August 21st, 6,000 people in Plymouth and the surrounding southern regions were either evacuated to the northern half of the island or ferried to Guadeloupe and St. Kitts, around the time that the size of the phreatic eruptions increased significantly. However, as eruptive activity entered a lull, fears of the volcano's impact were dispelled, and, after two weeks, people were allowed to return to Plymouth, the violent phreatic eruptions having been replaced by a period of significant growth on the lava dome, expanding at a rate of 11 cubic metres of magmatic material per second. Volcanologists were baffled by the alarmingly high rate at which the mountain was growing, with the development of the lava dome accompanied by dozens of partial collapses per day that resulted in pyroclastic flows that tumbled down its slopes though most of these flows were restricted to the area immediately around the peak, and thus populous regions were spared for the time being. Lava domes hundreds of feet across would build, collapse into pyroclastic flows, and then be rebuilt to their previous size within a few days, while the most unsettling aspect for those living on the island was the sound, with the high-pressure movement of magma within the volcano creating loud groaning noises that could be heard all over Montserrat. On December 1st, the southern half of the island was evacuated again when pyroclastic flows breached the crater, leading to 6,000 people being moved to the north, this evacuation lasting for a period of one month, with residents moving back into Plymouth in January 1996. By now, aid agencies from across the world, as well as the British government, provided substantial amounts of money in order to keep the ailing island nation financially afloat, while on March 31st, Volcanic activity, after a period of significant lava dome expansion, increased dramatically, with pyroclastic flows tumbling down the eastern flank of the mountain into the Caribbean Sea, destroying crops and killing livestock. The magmatic rock ejected from the volcano extended the east coast of Montserrat by several hundred square feet during each instance, and new beaches were formed though with activity continuing to rise, a state of emergency was declared, and on April 3, 1996, Plymouth and the surrounding regions were evacuated for the final time, assisted by helicopters and fast boats from HMS Liverpool. The task of housing 6,000 of the island's 9,500 people on what little land was available for settlement in the north was a logistical nightmare, with 1,366 people being kept in shelters, while the British government initiated the Voluntary Evacuation Scheme to allow those evicted by the volcano to live in the UK for two years, with the population, by August, having dwindled to 7,500, and the capital city of Plymouth was left a ghost town. However, despite the boundary being patrolled by the Royal Montserrat Police Force, people refused to leave their homes and fields, and would regularly sneak through into the exclusion zone to live and work in the land they'd grown up in even while, during September, the situation became increasingly worse when the initial period of lava dome expansion ended with a gigantic magmatic explosion, destroying the town of Long Ground. Fears were exacerbated further by instability in the wall of English's crater, known as Galway's Wall, 
which confined the effects of the expanding lava dome and the eruption to the largely unpopulated east and southeastern sides of the island, this wall forming the only major barrier between the volcano's destructive power and the settlements to the southwest, including Plymouth. Volcanologists were therefore concerned by the appearance of fractures on Galway's wall during November 1996, with Plymouth and the surrounding area now directly threatened by pyroclastic flows and lahars, this eventually taking place in February 1997, when the lava dome broke through Galway's wall, meaning it was only a matter of time before a collapse of the dome would bury the southwest of the island, which was still being used by groups of farmers. In May 1997, expansion of the dome shifted to the north, but the loss of pressure in the south created instability, this resulting in collapses of the dome to the north that sent pyroclastic clouds tumbling down towards the airport in early June, and an emergency jetty was created in the event the airport was destroyed. On June 25, 1997, the volcano claimed its first victims when part of the dome's southern flank collapsed, sending a pyroclastic flow over two miles down the southwestern face of the mountain, overtopping the valley into which it was confined, and engulfing areas of farmland around Cork Hill, where dozens of people were working the land, leaving, in its wake, 19 people dead, this event forcing the exclusion zone to be entirely off-limits to all civilian activity, and farmers would never return to their fields. On July 4th, the first pyroclastic flows reached the capital, leaving large portions of the city buried in volcanic debris up to 20 feet deep, while uncontrollable fires ravaged the streets, the outcomes of the damage rendering this once pleasant destination in the Caribbean completely beyond recovery, undoing W.H. Bramble's efforts to open up Montserrat to the wider world through the emerging tourist trade, with the magnificent hotels, restaurants, bars and entertainment venues now left in ruins. However, despite the city being completely destroyed, People would return to Plymouth, but for dubious reasons, as in February 1998, it was discovered by members of HMS Liverpool, who were surveying the damage in the city streets, that the vault in the main bank had been robbed, presenting the most significant crime of opportunity throughout the entire event. Upon the mountain, the lava dome was blown to pieces by massive and frequent volcanian explosions, accompanied by fountain collapse or gravitational pyroclastic flows, these, unlike pyroclastic flows caused by the collapse of the lava dome, being formed through material ejected thousands of feet into the air, returning to the ground and tumbling down the flanks of the volcano at speeds in excess of 400 miles an hour. Volcanian pyroclastic flows spread further than those previously created by the collapse of the lava dome, burying both Plymouth and the airport, these eruptions continuing throughout the remainder of 1997, with ashfall in the north of the island resulting in more residents choosing to move away, reducing the population to just 3,000 people by 1998. The last major event on the volcano during this eruptive period occurred on December 26, 1997, when Galway's wall finally collapsed, leading to a massive pyroclastic flow that swept down the southwest flank of the mountain and through Plymouth, though after this, Magma expansion would cease, and, with the exception of ash venting, eruptive activity would reduce to almost a halt by May 1999. Volcanic activity continued for a number of years after the devastating eruption of 1995 to 1997, but this was largely restricted to ash venting that blanketed the inhabited south of the island, with the most significant eruption taking place between November 2009 and February 2010 which resulted in several pyroclastic flows travelling down the eastern flanks of the mountain, burying what remained of W.H. Bramble Airport. Aside from authorised personnel such as members of the Royal Montserrat Police Force, admittance into the exclusion zone is strictly prohibited, therefore everything that was left in 1997 has remained in a slowly deteriorating state, while on occasion, guided tours take people into the remains of Plymouth, giving visitors a true illustration of how devastating the effects of a volcanic eruption can be on a major city. While Plymouth remains the de jure capital, Little Bay in the north is now generally considered its replacement, with a new port facility opening in 2014, though Plymouth's destruction, as well as the loss of half the island, caused economic decline that is still felt to this day, a huge gap in the infrastructural capabilities of Montserrat being caused that would take years to replace, as hospitals, fire stations, schools and a seat of government needed to be re-established elsewhere. 
By the end of 1997, only 1,200 people remained on Montserrat, with many either settling on other Caribbean islands or migrating to the United Kingdom, when full residency rights were granted for those affected by the disaster in 1998, followed by full British citizenship being approved in 2002. Though in contrast to this exodus, a gradual return of people to the island has seen the population climb back to 5,215 people as of 2019. The first major step in the recovery process was the opening of a brand new airport in 2005 by the Princess Royal, this facility being christened the John A. Osborne Airport, while the seat of government is currently sited in Braids, but as Little Bay is expanded with new port facilities and services, the expectation is that the government will eventually be moved to this new capital. Following the start of volcanic activity in 1995, the Montserrat Volcano Observatory, or MVO, was established in order to monitor, research, educate and advise both citizens and government agencies as to the traits and dangers of volcanic activity. And with Soufrière Hills having become one of the most active volcanoes in the world, with frequent eruptions of varying magnitude continuing to this day, the MVO is now housed in its own observatory building in the village of Flemings. In the end, the eruption of the Soufrière Hills volcano between 1995 and 1997 was an event that seemed to add to a tragic losing streak for the island of Montserrat during the late 20th century, with political turmoil and the impact of Hurricane Hugo being the two initial starts of a downward spiral for this island nation after years of prosperity in tourism and agriculture. However, despite the violent destruction of the capital Plymouth at the hands of the volcano and an exclusion zone still being enforced for over half the country, the plucky island nation of Montserrat has shown a superb recovery regardless of its woes, and is now settling back into being a generally stable Caribbean economy on the sun-kissed leeward islands.